So I went through and did a hasty rewrite of the message today. And by a rewrite, I mean I changed a couple lines in my outline here. But I saw a picture on Facebook this morning that changed how I wanted to approach this morning. And I do want to give you a brief warning ahead of time. I'm going to tell a story that involves an act of violence in a school. So if that is something that is triggering to you, you are more than welcome to step out, go grab a cup of coffee, you know, come back later though because I don't want you to feel that you have been abandoned, but this is going to talk about an act of violence in a school and I know that can be triggering for some people. But before we get to that, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can as long as ever you can. This quote is going to undergird our next six weeks together. It's also going to be the basis of this year's stewardship campaign. And when we hear it, I want us to be invited to stretch ourselves. Not to the breaking point, but simply stretch ourselves as we try to have a prophetic imagination of what it means to do good. To do all the good you can, by all the means you can. In all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. That's a quote that's commonly attributed to John Wesley, and try as I might, I cannot find anywhere where he actually wrote that down. And the man wrote so much, you would imagine that, you know, just by happenstance, he probably would have written that at some point, but I cannot find it. But what I did find was that it was a very common aphorism, um, a very common saying in the time of John Wesley. And if he didn't say it himself, many of his sermons, many of his journal entries reflect a very similar idea that we should be doing all the good we can by all the means we can, in all the ways we can, in all the places we can, at all the times we can, to all the people we can, as long as ever we can. So I'm going to invite us to let ourselves be stretched by that for a moment today. And then I wanted us to start by thinking not so much about doing good, but I want us to think about who we do good to. Or maybe to put it another way, who is worthy enough to be treated with goodness by us. I kind of feel that that might harken back to one of those primal questions. Go back to the book of Genesis right after Cain murders his brother Abel and God comes and asks Cain, where is your brother? And Cain does that, am I my brother's keeper question. I think that's a very similar question when we think about who should we be doing good to? Who is worthy of being treated with goodness? I think we need to think about that before we get into anything else. And I kind of came up with two good answers to that. Well, two answers. One of them is good and one of them is crap. Um, here's the bad one. We should do good to those who have earned the right to be treated good. We should do good to those who have earned it. And we can probably all think of people in our lives that have done something that has deserved a good response from us. Certain family members, friends, teachers, co-workers, people that have treated us in such a way that makes us want to reciprocate. They treat us well, we treat them well. So that's a bad answer, I think, as to who we should treat with goodness. 
Here's one that's a little bit better. We come to realize that all of us deserve to be treated with goodness. And we also come to realize that none of us have always, 100% of the times in our lives, acted in ways that deserve to be treated with goodness. We have all come up with shortcomings. All of us have done something to someone at some point that would make us possibly unworthy of being treated with goodness. And when we realize that all of us have something that makes us unworthy, maybe then we take the next step and realize that worth doesn't matter so much. That we should treat other people with goodness, not because of anything that they have done, but simply because it is a better way to live than the alternative. Treating each other with goodness recognizes the sacredness of God in each person. But then if we think about it that way, there's one step further I want to take it. Because if goodness is something that we are called to extend to everyone, then I want us to also think that maybe there are certain places where we need to be intentional with our goodness. Maybe by focusing on those who have been marginalized and oppressed. Because maybe it is a good idea, if we're looking for a place to start spreading goodness, maybe it's a good idea to start in those places in the world that haven't experienced as much goodness as they deserve. We might call this in the church a missional priority, to focus on those places where there has been a lack of goodness as a good place to start sharing our goodness. I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's really hard to treat others well, to share goodness with certain people. Anybody have some of those people in your life that it's just hard? Somebody honest there. Yeah, we, there are some people where it's just hard. This morning, this is the part of the message I changed just this morning. I was going to talk about the situation in Gaza right now because that's a place where I think a lot of us see it is hard to extend goodness in a place of so much violence and hatred. But I was scrolling through Facebook this morning. I don't do that very often, but I was up a little early this morning. I was scrolling through, and I saw a picture, and I'm going to ask Randy to put it up on the screen here. And I stopped because I recognized somebody in that picture. Actually, I recognized a few people, but um, I recognized one person right away. There on the right, that's uh, one of our district superintendents, Debbie Earthrall. She was my boss for about a year. She wasn't the one I recognized right away. The person I recognized is the person in the blue shirt in the middle there. His name's John. He was one of my classmates in high school. This was a picture taken at the United Methodist Church in East Greenbush. That's uh, where I went to high school in East Greenbush. And I recognized John as one of my classmates. The classmate who in our junior year brought a gun into school and started to shoot my classmates, my teachers. He kind of changed everything for us in a day. He went to prison for 17 years. And now just saying that, I realize I've been out of high school for over 17 years, and that's making me feel older than I did this morning. But this was taken at an act of reconciliation that he was part of at that church and in that community. Because coming out of prison, he has started to try to bring some goodness into the world. We can take the picture down now. But as I looked at that, I'm going to tell you all, I felt something, I think it was right here in my chest, that said, I don't want to extend goodness to him. 
I realize that they are in an act of reconciliation. But that man brought a lot of harm to a lot of people. Luckily, nobody was killed in that attack. This was several years after Columbine, but before our kind of modern experience of school shootings. So none of us had trained for it. We didn't have drills for it. And it was only by sheer luck that he wasn't very good at killing people. But there's that place right here that says it's hard to extend goodness to somebody who brought so much pain. And that's just a small personal anecdote. I'm sure all of us have places in our lives that are similar, have people in our lives who have done harm, and we say it's hard to extend goodness when harm has been done. Jesus tells this parable, this parable of this great wedding party that he compares to the kingdom of God. And it is one of the most beautiful, but also one of the most troubling parables Jesus tells. Because if we take it too literally, we might get caught up in the exact kind of thing that Jesus is warning us against. Instead, I think what we have to do is we have to take the message, the core message of the parable, which I believe is that the goodness of God is open to everybody. That some may reject it, some may have a hard time believing it, some of us may have that place right here in our bodies that says, how can goodness be extended to this certain individual? But the core message of the parable is that everyone, everyone gets the goodness of God extended to them. And I truly believe that we, not only as individuals, but as a church, the body of Christ in the world today, I truly believe that we have to at least try to be as welcoming as God seems to be. And for some of us, with some people, that's going to be hard. But I think if we want to start touching on the beauty of God, we have to at least try to see the world as God must see it. There's a story of two preachers, John Wesley and his one-time colleague, Reverend Whitfield. They had at one point worked very closely together. And then, as happens more often than you would think, they start to disagree with one another on theology of all things. Theology has never divided people before, but all of a sudden they have this deep theological rift between them. And they start going their separate ways, doing their separate things. They've each got their own followings. Until one day John Wesley becomes sick. To the point where he is thought to be near death. He's not. He gets better. But Reverend Whitfield writes him a very beautiful letter at this point. And I'm not sure about, you know, what was going through their minds at this point, but that letter almost seemed like an act of reconciliation with somebody who had been divided for so long, realizing that they still have a lot of good in common. At some point around this time, one of Whitfield's followers came to him and asked the question, we won't see John Wesley in heaven, will we? And Whitfield humbly replied, Yes, you're right. We won't see him there. He will be so close to the throne of God, and we will be so far away that we won't be able to see him. <laughs> I've thought about that a lot with the current state of the United Methodist Church. We are in this deep moment of theological division, of social division, of physical division now with these disaffiliations. And as much as I deeply, deeply disagree with how some of these churches that have left the denomination 
have interpreted Scripture. I am still discovering wonderful ways that they are doing ministry, that they are extending goodness, and I'm discovering wonderful ways that I still extend goodness to these friends who have gone their own way. It can be an incredibly humbling moment when you have somebody that you have been in deep disagreement with, and yet you extend goodness nonetheless. This is what I want us to be thinking about this season. Because I hope our worship inspires you. And I pray that this community continues its powerful witness of flinging open the doors and welcoming all God's people. Because Jesus told us a parable where everyone got invited to the party. Not everyone stayed, not everyone showed up, but everyone was invited. How beautifully God must see the world. How wondrous God must see this world to say, I want all of them at my party. The good and the bad. The righteous and the unrighteous. The deserving and the undeserving. I want them all at the party. And if God sees the world with that much beauty, how can we as a church do anything less than recognize the sacred beauty in every single person God created, welcoming them all with arms opened wide and goodness ready to share. Let's be in prayer together, folks. God of marvelous wonder, we are approaching you in this time of worship getting ready for the party that is to come. A party where we will see those who we love and those we struggle with. A party where we will discover that your goodness knows no boundaries. Your love knows no barriers. Your grace knows no borders. Where everyone is invited to experience the awe and wonder of the divine. I pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen.